Well, thank you very much, Mark. Evening, everybody. A lovely day for it today. Cycling, that is. I hope those who do cycle got out today. Perfect weather for it. Um, if you can still see me, I, I thought for this special occasion, I'd uh, uh, drag out the presidential sash. So this is the Ballam Cycling Club presidential sash that I'm wearing. I appreciate the light's not very good. So uh, the president used to wear this um, uh, at dinners and such like. I think it's about 60, 70 years old, but I thought I'd uh, drag it out. But, but it's a bit hot, so I'm going to take it off now. So, um, mm -hmm. There we go. So, um, so I'm going to start actually with a little bit of a, a, a caveat. I've called this 19th century and uh, uh, 19th century cycling boom, but um, uh, and I've tried to keep it uh, Lambeth friendly, but I do stray occasionally from the uh, the date and the uh, and the borough. I don't think we should let uh, dates and boroughs get in the way of a good story. So I've uh, I've been a little bit flexible, but kept it tight where I can. Um, I, sh I should declare I'm no historian either or academic in this field. Um, and there's heaps of stuff on this, some really interesting stuff out there about technical advancements, London life and recreation and Victorian times and things like that. But um, this is, I'd say, this is an enthusiast historical tour tonight, really. And I've just been guided by my own curiosity over the, uh, from what I've learned over the, uh, over the years. Um, I must declare I'm not a Lambeth man either. I'm, um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I get to Lambeth for the cricket and uh, the Brixton windmill for a few gigs or two more time, but... Uh, um, um, I'm not a Lambeth man, so I guess that I, I guess that uh, um, suggests why should you bother listening to me for the next uh, 35 minutes? Um, uh, um, uh, well, it's this guy's fault. Oh, hang on. This is uh, so it's a family history project. This all came from from my my personal um, interest in all this. Um, so there's my family outside Alderbrook Road around 1910 in Ballam. Uh, so we uh, we do have South London roots uh, back from about 1820 actually. So my great great grandmother uh, lived at Stockwell Terrace in Lambeth. Um, in 1835, they lived at St Anne's Road in Lambeth. 1851, Union Road, Clapham, then to Ballam, um, and then Tooting and Carshorton, where I am now. So I'm uh, talking to you from Carshorton. So uh, every generation we move out a travel card zone um, in 200 years. So. Um, and in fact, in 200 years, we've moved 9.8 miles as a family. So um, we're not ones for change. Um, so that's uh, so that's where my background into all this is. Um, and the cycling angle, well, that on the left is my great uncle, Harry Darby. And if you look hard enough on the badge in the center of the, uh, on his, uh, on his uh, jersey there, that badge is of Ballam Cycling Club. And he's actually got a pin badge on his uh, jacket as well. And uh, in July, 2016, I, uh, uh, got this photograph from my uh, uncle who uh, sadly died um, oh, yeah. and uh, I thought it'd be, oh, I thought it'd be interesting, to look, interesting to look at um, look at the club look at the history and anyway that's what got me uh, going into this field I launched a blog to find out a little bit more about the club there's nothing online or anything I could find out about it so I launched a uh, I launched a blog and a year later I thought it'd be uh, fun to relaunch the club on its 120th anniversary so this club Started in 1897, finished about in 1985, and so we restarted it. And now we've got 100 members uh, cycling, um, and I continue to unearth stories about the club and, and such like. So anyway, against that backdrop, it means that I've got a little bit of um, cycling. I've been doing some cycling, South London cycling research over the years. So I thought I'd share what I know with you guys uh, today. So I think it's... Um, uh, it's uh, Kick off properly. So, so that, technical trouble. There you go. So, um, so overall, then, so why the 1890s? It's a, so it's a golden period, really. There's loads of things coming together. Uh, whether you're a commuter, explorer, sports fan, you like to take part in sport, whether you're a soldier, whether you're an entertainer, manufacturer, salesman, uh, socialite, middle class, working class, man, woman. Uh, in, in the 19th century, the bike really does have something for everyone. The key factors in this, technology is making it easier. So uh, the penny, par penny farthing or high wheeler or ordinary as it was called, um, has been uh, superseded by the safety bike, which um, you can see there on the top left. And as we know it today, which came around 1884, around that time, but actually it's in more in common use around 1890. There's the invention of the pneumatic tyre as well. So before the pneumatic tyre, which is invented in 1888 by John Dunlop. Um, uh, before that, everyone's riding around on uh, rickety old solid things that um, can um, hurt the backside a little bit. So, um, so technology is making it easy for people. 
Uh, there's more sport and leisure time, of course. So people have got a bit more leisure time to watch sports or the um, explosion. There's an explosion in club life as people want to get out there and do it. Um, and exploration as well. People want to explore the countryside. They've got the uh, time and the uh, and the technology behind them to do it. And actually, it becomes a professional sport as well. This period is a big time for the rise of it in a professional circuit. And we'll look at uh, the rise of the velodrome. The there's uh, heaps of velodromes around our area at this time. Cycling for transport, so it becomes cheap and quick. Um, and in the late 1890s, the cost of a bike is in the grasp of the um, working classes. Um, it's a good way to make a li uh, living. So at this time, everyone's using bikes. So it means everyone's making them, distributing them, repairing them. It really is boom time. Um, it's, it's the emancipation of women as well. Uh, it gave women freedoms they didn't have previously. Uh, and they could uh, do what they didn't used to do, get out and about there and uh, could wear what they never used to wear. So um, it uh, changes in that regard. And it all leads to a big cultural phenomenon. It's um, mid, late, uh, mid to late 1890s. Cycling is, is the craze that's sweeping the nation. Uh, if it was on Twitter now, it would definitely be trending. Um, it will also worth saying that in war as well, bike is also finding a place in war and we'll touch on that. So why South London? Well, obviously it's a South London festival, but the, um, so why South London? Well, South London mirrors exactly what's going on in the, in, in, uh, nationally, but it also is driving some of this stuff. It's got some of the biggest names in the sport. It's got the biggest clubs. It's got the biggest shows. It's got the biggest venues. Um, so we'll look at the, uh, it nationally uh, through the lens of that South London uh, viewpoint. Um, let's have a look at participation then. Uh, the rise in it nationally. So the institutional membership figures show a huge increase in participation during this time. So data published in them, some lovely old books by Henley Sturmey, who did the cyclist yearbook, showed 172% increase in cycling during this period. So in three years, it went up from 16,343 in 1895 to 44,491 members in 1897 and it would hit a peak of 60,449. Now that's just members of the CTC, which is the cycling union. So that's just a small snapshot of actually how many people were cycling during this time. And to show you how much it dropped off in 1918, it went back to 8,500. So the rise in cycling clubs at this time, so the yearbook showed that there were 75 clubs in London in existence in 1879. And this rose to 173 in 1897 and 256 a year later. So a huge, huge increase uh, in, in these clubs. And these are clubs registered, of course. There's, there was plenty of other clubs out there that weren't bothering to register with the um, cycling union. You didn't have to. Um, snapshot of the uh, Lambeth area from 1988. You see there's 26 clubs here in operation. Uh, Brixton and Clapham are real hot spots. Uh, headquarters are usually pubs, hotels. Um, and again, worth noting, this is, uh, this is uh, not an official inventory. This is just people who've registered their club. There would have been a lot more there. Some male female clubs in there. There's uh, quite a few male and female clubs and indeed some female only clubs in there. So quite rare for this period. Um, membership of these clubs can vary from about 10 to 300. Um, my favourite in there is the splendidly named, number 14 there, the splendidly named Lambeth Pottery Cycle and Photography Club. I uh, hope they didn't all do this at once. Um, it's uh, worth mentioning as an aside that uh, cycling and photography often went together. Obviously, uh, people were going out uh, on their bikes and uh, the, uh, the rise of the camera as, a, as, a, as, a, as it was getting smaller, it could be taken with them on bikes and uh, photography for the countryside was a big thing. And in fact, throughout time, um, so looking at records from Ballam from the 1950s, they were running for uh, photography club uh, for the club in the 1950s. So they often come, go uh, hand in hand, not so much the pottery. Um, as an aside, uh, all the pictures there, there's some lovely pictures there. You can see at the top, that's the South London Ramblers uh, Cycling Club, who were based out of Clapham. That's the captain, Fred Herrier, uh, on his penny farthing. And the bottom there is West Norwood uh, Cycling Club out and about in uh, about 1880. Um, is uh, Let's have a look at some of the uh, clubs in the area then. Some, uh, here's some of the club badges. I've, um, I've uh, utilised some of the books here just to show some of the intricate work on the badges. There's some really, some lovely designs from the, that really encapsulate the period. 
It must have been a bit of a bugger to uh, to embroider or to put on the uh, uh, enamel badge. But um, there's some of the badges, and you can still some some of these uh, crop up on eBay occasionally. Um, so some of them are connected to manufacturers. So there's a Ballam Social, which is connected to Fred Ball Cycles. It came out of the uh, Bedford Hotel. Some are to institutions. Uh, the St George's one is quite unusual. So uh, really, uh, so that's St George's Hospital. It, it were registered in 1879. Uh, some, of course, signalled where they come from. Uh, Tooting BC there and Clapham Park CC. Um, and there's someone there you can only uh, speculate where the names come from. The, uh, my favourites are Incognita CC and Tortoise CC. So I'm not sure where the uh, influence for those were. Uh, interesting looking at the club information on some of these that uh, the cost of the membership and it highlights who they were being run by here this is the lower middle classes to the upper middle classes and indeed the uh, high society these clubs are being run by so um, uh, I think one of them there is two quid a year something like that which say it's not uh, it's not cheap uh, in 18 in 1890 that's for sure let's have a look at a couple of, a couple of the clubs in uh, focus We've got a rich heritage of uh, clubs in uh, in our area. I'm going to focus on the Delorn. Uh, Delorn Institute uh, were based in Kennington. That picks from uh, 1893. Uh, the Delorns uh, came to England uh, and they in fact go, go back from all the way from to 1582. It was a French Huguenot physician and cleric William Delorn who uh, fled uh, France to come to the country. Forward to the 19th century, and Chapman Delorn was the High Sheriff of Kent, magistrate, man of substance, land owning in South London and Kent, and had a passion for sport. Uh, this passion led to the forming of Delorn Institute, and the Delorn Institute Cycling Club was formed and opened its programme in spring 1889. Uh, the records show their first ride was a poodle around Clapham Common for an hour and a half. In those early years, there was apparently no properly organised races, just a number of impromptu hazardous burn-ups as they were described uh, uh, on the wood paved and I quote here on the wood wood paved road between Kennington Cross and Clapham. Um, March 19th 1892 a small group met at the institute to start drawing up the rules for the renamed Delorn Cycling Club as it's known now. Their first proper headquarters was the ship public house in Kennington Road and it held its first meeting there on December 21st 1892. Uh, first um, recorded Delorme Club event was a five mile handicap on the Oxford Road in 1893 uh, and later that year a two mile handicap race was held on a track at Hyde Farm, uh, Ballam, uh, apparently by the arrangement of the Delorme Harriers, there's obviously a, a tight link there. In 1894 a 10 mile track championship at Ballam Hyde Farm was won by a George Wakefield. Some uh, some uh, interesting stuff on the uh, annual dinners, which give you an uh, give you an insight in what these some of these clubs were like. The annual dinners of 1896 and 87 were held at the Dover Castle in Westminster Bridge Road, but the favourite spot for the winter social events were the Horns Assembly Rooms in Kennington. The dinners and concerts were elaborate affairs. It has to be said, musicians had to be hired, um, just the pianist sometimes for dinners. Singers uh, were found to supplement the renderings of members themselves. And to make sure the concerts went with a swing, a stage manager and even a musical director would be appointed. So these were no small affairs. Uh, for the 1989 concert, um, reading some of the uh, history books, we learn that the tickets at the Horns cost two shillings and Mr Larkin's seven piece band was engaged for two guineas and the doorkeeper was given a two shilling tip. Uh, the best singer got uh, 10 shilling sixpence for two turns. Um, these occasions, of course, were an opportunity for the club to raise funds, uh, as well as everyone having a good old time. Um, the annual dinners and smoking concerts, like the club membership, were strictly for men only, but garden parties were a different matter. And again, uh, the, um, uh, the men and uh, their uh, wives, daughters, etc., would uh, congregate for, uh, for uh, events um, during the summer months. The club entered the 20th century with a new headquarters uh, at the White Bear in Kennington Park Road. And uh, H.G. Benwell was the club secretary in 1897-99 and he ran a bike shop in Kennington Road. Delorme these days used uh, Herne Hill Velodrome as their headquarters and they're still going strong and a well-established club in the area. Uh, moving on. Uh, there we go. 
Ah, so here we are to um, to Ballon then. So this is my club. Now my club, all our records uh, were lost uh, to a World War II bomb. So everything uh, before 1922 was lost. So uh, a lot of the stuff I had to pull together by scratch, but we're starting to get a big picture. This picture here is from 19, 1913. Um, and I think they're on Wimbledon uh, Common. Um, for Ballon, uh, all roads lead to the pub trade and the Masons. And uh, George Huntley founded the club in 1897. Uh, he was based at the Ballam Hotel, which is uh, now the region. And the club was, uh, the uh, uh, hotel was used as HQ from 1897 until 1926. And uh, as an aside, we uh, reformed the club and we had our first uh, get together in the, in the uh, same region place uh, 122 years later. Um, it was a mixed of female and male club uh, in the early years. Uh, Hunley's roots are in Streatham. He was born 1868 and baptised at St. Leonard's. Um, in uh, 1869, uh, and he he was exposed to pub life at an early age. His, his uh, father, Richard Huntley, was the publican, and his mum was the uh, Susanna was the assistant at the Pied Bull in Streatham, uh, the Bull in Streatham as it is now, before he took it over. And the family's pub roots, though, can be traced all the way back to the 1700. Uh, on his mother's side, uh, both sets of grand grandparents had family members in the victualler trade, as were his great great grandparents, the Lilies. And the Lilies uh, were victuallers at the Duke of Devonshire in Ballam, um, uh, the Dev uh, and the Devonshire as it is now. Uh, George lived in Belvoir, 60 Christchurch Road on Stretton Hill. There's a, there's a strong uh, link to the Freemasons in uh, all this. The first evidence of George's involvement in the Freemasons is from a member's scroll in 1889 and he was still paying his dues right until his death in 1920. He belonged to the South Norwood Lodge, Ballam Lodge, Panmore Lodge at various points in his life and rose to the office of Worshipful Master of the Latter, uh, the highest honour to which a lodge can appoint any of its members. Um, and it's interesting to look at the member scrolls because they're full of traders and shopkeeper, shopkeepers from the local area and it includes a lot of Ballam CC members uh, and connections there. Um, and those also involved in the uh, victualler trade. So, so uh, I've never been able to pinpoint it, but was was Ballam a Masonic club or was it a club that just had a lot of Masons in it is something that um, I've not been able to nail, but um, it's, a, it's an interesting track. There's a strong Masonic link with cycling in the area. So there's a, the actual cycling lodge, uh, 2246, was based in Surrey. Uh, it was formed in 1888. And the Brixton Ramblers Lodge uh, was formed in 1909 by several members of the Brixton Ramblers Cycling Club. Um, and uh, I showed you the uh, presidential, the club's presidential sash at the start of the event. And, it, and it, as you can see, it does, it does look very Masonic. Um, Huntley also had connections with the uh, South London Harriers, um, but I'm still investigating that in terms, of, um, in terms of what they actually were. But I look forward to that. That's this year's project. Let's uh, have a look at some of the characters. This is... Uh, 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 A.W. Hunt, and so um, so uh, Ballam's early early championships were held at Crystal Palace, and we'll have a little look at Crystal Palace later. Um, and shortly after its formation, uh, the club had some top cyclists riding for the club. So William Lower, who represented Britain at the 1908 Olympics, he also raced for Putney. Um, and member A.W. Hunt, he in 1904 beat the 25 mile amateur tandem pace record. And in 1905, he broke the Southern Roads tandem pace record. That's uh, basically uh, Purley to Horsham and back. Um, the photo there on the right hand side uh, is uh, the first, it's the Ballam Challenge Cup he won. He won it, he, he, uh, he won three times in a row, so he got to keep the cup and the cup's still with the uh, family. And there's a couple of pictures of it. Uh, um, and we're saying that so the club is again full of lower middle class, that shopkeep, uh, middle class. Um, um, contingent. Um, if you can still see me, I did. Uh, I have got uh, one of the trophies with me. So this here, I've got in my hand, is the George Huntley Cup, named after. Uh, and in fact, he uh, paid for it. Oh, there we go. I'm back on. I think so. This is the. This is the George Huntley Cup. So first given in 1914. And it, along with uh, quite a few other trophies, is now up at my loft, and it needs a needs a bit of uh, silver, silver care certainly. So hopefully you can see that. Um, 
So that's the that's the a bit of, bit about club life. So you can see club life's booming. Let's uh, take a little look at the uh, industry. So during this period, the cycling industry as a whole is uh, absolutely booming. It's a huge employer. It's got um, seven hundred. Uh, there's over seven hundred cycle manufacturers producing bikes with splendid names like the Excelsior Empire, and uh, usually something with the word Royal in it. Uh, Coventry is the manufacturing capital of the world. So cycling companies. Uh, from there and elsewhere are being floated on the stock exchange. Their cycling exhibition organisers are reporting record numbers of visitors um, and uh, exhibitors and indeed machines for sale. Uh, there were two large exhibitions and they were both held our way, uh, illustrated here by two photos. The Stanley Bicycle Show at Crystal Palace um, and the National Cycle Show again at Crystal Palace, one in 1890 and one in 1896. Um, so the Stanley Bicycle Show uh, was held between 1878 and 1910, originally organised by the Stanley Bicycle Club um, until about 1886 when it was taken over by Manufacturers Committee and it moved about a bit for three years, but it moved about a bit, but for three years it was held at Crystal Palace, 1891, 1889 to 1891. And just look at the figures on the expansion of the year. So in 1889 there were 200 exhibitors. Uh, and a thousand bikes on show in 1890, 230 and 1,125. And in 1891, 312 exhibitors and 1,500 uh, bikes on show. Big business. Uh, Crystal Palace played host to the National Cycle Show, 1893 and 1903. Uh, and in fact, it held two shows. In fact, it, was, it did for one year, it held two shows in one year. So that's the, uh, that's the shows. Here's a snapshot of some local manufacturing. Let's have a look at some of those local manufacturers. So I did a little bit of research uh, on when I was uh, looking at Balance City and I looked at manufacturers and distributors known to have existed in the area between 1890 and 1914. And with just a three mile radius uh, of the Balham Hotel where BCC called home, uh, there were 54 manufacturers and distributors known to have existed. So it's an extraordinary number. Um, Langton and Co. offered the Merling Cycle. I think uh, where's Langton? Here we are, top right. Um, and uh, they offered the Merlin Cycle from 1882. Uh, in 1884, they were uh, based in uh, Cold Harbour Lane and Effra Road in Brixton. For around 1890, they made the Langton, and in 1893, they extended their premises in Cold Harbour, Cold Harbour Lane. They were still advertising in 1898. Uh, the picture on the top right there is a is a pacing quad, and we'll learn about pacing and velodromes uh, in the next five or ten minutes or so. As you see, an extraordinary uh, bit of machinery. He was uh, he was a uh, president of the club, and uh, so he would have worn that very sash that uh, I was uh, wearing at the start. Um, a Churchill was a member of Catford CC. Um, uh, that's the uh, top middle. You see his bike there. Um, um, he made the Streatham and uh, Stockwell Engineering Club uh, Company rather were based at Stockwell Road and made the unusual looking Stockwell Safety in 1897. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't get on that thing um, if you paid me. Uh, there, there seems to be a penchant for naming your uh, bike after uh, after where it came from. Um, never really been able to drill down why that is the case. You can make a couple of guesses, I guess. So Samuel Miller uh, made the Brixton, John Porter made the Clapham. And the Keane brothers made the Norwood and the Henry Ray made the Ballon. Uh, snapshot of the second hand market. So the second hand market was vibrant, as you can imagine. And here's an advert for uh, Carey & Co around uh, 1890, based in Brixton Road and Clapham Road. Uh, Self-declared the largest dealers of second hand machines. Um, and uh, we talked about the spectrum of how uh, it was right across the board and of course this is how some of the working classes could get in on uh, bike ownership by second hand uh, by buying second hand uh, bikes some uh, more manufacturers some local jcp tagney uh, to cagney uh, jcp john charles peter originally pietro johan carlo um, uh, grew up in East London before residing in at uh, 108 Cavendish Road, Clapham, for many years. He's the character on the right-hand side there. Um, Tkagney uh, was a cyclist of some note in the 1880s, uh, riding for Canterbury and City of London. But it was as a manufacturer he made his name 
and uh, Takagni, Holt and Co built the TAC high wheelers and TAC safety, uh, which you can see there on the uh, right hand side. Uh, the TAC cycle works were at 86 Gresham Road, Brixton. Uh, by 1889, they had moved to Cold Harbour Lane, seemed to be the place for uh, bicycle manufacturing. Um, and their range included the TAC Diamond Safety and TAC Tricycle. Uh, JCP Takagni was a vice president of Ballam CC. Um, but um, some of these manufacturing uh, giants used to, um, um, shall we say, uh, give the uh, cycling clubs a few quid um, as, uh, to support them and then uh, uh, call themselves president and uh, vice president and such like. So uh, lots, of, um, lots of deals being made. One more, uh, I've got one more. Pawsey, worth uh, having a look at Pawsey. I say I'm a, I'm a, a little early on this one, but uh, Pawsey's were around. Um, uh, Herbert James Pawsey was an established manufacturer as early as 1880. Uh, he made the Pioneer, he made the University and CCC and Wanderer uh, high wheelers uh, from Bedford Road in Clapham from 1879 to 1884 and later from Park Road in uh, Clapham. Uh, he, uh, Pawsey himself, died from a fall from his bike in 1886. And the firm was uh, dissolved in uh, 1889. So lots of lots of bike action, which means uh, it's worth taking a look at popular culture. Um, uh, it, it's uh, cycling is such a big thing that it does uh, it, uh, infuse itself into into popular culture. So we'll have a little look at it nationally and, and we're starting right at the top with the king. Um, and then we'll look at some of the uh, some some of the things going on locally. So. Um, yeah, so if for a measure of cycling pop, cycling's popularity, look no further for endorsement from royalty and those from popular popular culture. Uh, Prince of Wales, uh, King Edward the Seventh, approved of cycling and often had a poodle himself. There he is on his bike. Um, but big names of music hall variety and entertainment were also quick to latch onto the craze to increase ticket sales. They were very savvy in this regard. Uh, a quote from Andrew Horrell in his book Popular Culture, which I quite like. He, he writes. Once a craze erupted, artists, playwrights and songwriters would incorporate it into their work. Up-to-date references to the craze could then be heard in music halls, stadiums and from ballad singers. Um, popular culture nationally uh, here's a good example uh, and you'll be familiar with this, I think. A song from cycling uh, from this period, the most famous was Daisy Bell, uh, Bicycle Built for Two, written by Harry Dakar in 1892. You could probably sing a verse and a chorus. Here's a extract from the original. There we go. Um, and uh, as an interesting aside, uh, where did, how, why was that song composed? Uh, well, Dakar was an English composer, first uh, came to the States, and he brought with him a bike for which he was charged import duty. And his friend, William Jerome, another songwriter, remarked lightly, it's lucky you didn't bring a bicycle built for two, otherwise you'd have to pay double duty. And Dakar was so taken with the phrase, that's why we've got that song uh, still in our heads today. So that's what's going on nationally. You can see that um, it is absolutely at the uh, front end of popular culture, bikes and cycling. Um, and there is the Daisy Bell advert. And there's Henry Dakar himself. Um, should have put that before, but there we go. Um, so locally, um, what's going on locally? So Eugene uh, Sandow was a famous uh, cycling advocate. Uh, he was a Victorian strongman known as the father of modern bodybuilding, uh, an international celebrity. 
he was described as the beau ideal of athlete, athletic elegance. And his name is immortalized in the Sandow Trophy, the uh, film Pumping Iron, uh, about the quest to win the trophy by leading, uh, by leading contestants, helped launch the careers of Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno. So he's, the trophy's uh, named after him. He lived at De Montfort House, a mansion at, uh, above Mount Ephraim Road. Uh, uh, now marked by, today marked by De Montford Parade. So he bemoaned the ill effects of a sedentary desk job and bearing in mind he was followed by millions of real celebrity. So whatever he said had real influence. Um, and he wasn't a fan of walking uh, for walking's sake, calling it tedious and effective. Um, on cycling, he said, um, each week the bicycle acquires an added skill and power which could not be done the week before. And uh, a quote here, and while he said, while he, and while he found the horseback riding exists, he admitted bikes would be the more practical mode of transport for most. Here's a quote from him there. A clerk on salary of 15 or $25 a week to whom the purchase and to keep of a horse would be impractical can easily buy a good cycle, which with reasonable care should last for many years, requires no feed and almost no expense for keeping it in order. Um, just a lovely quote. Um, Arthur Conan Doyle of this parish. So he was an acquaintance of Sandow, actually, having been judges, uh, been both judges at a bodybuilding competition together. And he, of course, was a Norwood resident and he was a, a, an enthusiastic cyclist himself. Uh, in, wrote, in fact, he wrote in 1903, The Adventure of the Solitary Cyclist, one of the 56 Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, Arthur and his wife used to venture out from their house at 12 Tennyson Road on their tandem bicycle and could uh, uh, often be seen cycling around in Streatham. He was, uh, he was also an advocate of its physical and mental benefits. And there's a famous quote from 1896 from him on cycling, where he says, when the spirits are low, when the day appears dark, when work becomes monotonous, when hope hardly seems worth having, just mount a bike and go out for a spin down the road without thought or anything but the ride you are taking. So cycling is very much in the mainstream popular culture. Um, as you can see. Dan Leno was, uh, so he, um, the most popular music hall and pantomime entertainer of all time, I'm sure you're uh, aware of his existence. At the height of his fame, he resided uh, at Cavendish Road, um, Clapham Road, and then he moved to Ackerman Road in Brixton before he moved a few months later to Springfield House in Atkins Road, Clapham Park, where he lived until his death. He, uh, cycling played a big part in, in his life. There he is. Uh, with the missus and, and uh, one of the children on, and a couple of bikes. Uh, he had a, uh, some cycling sketches and songs in his repertoire. So in 1987, Cycling Magazine published a cartoon of Leno as Widow Twanky on a bike. Uh, among several films that I made was a cinematic one shot called uh, Dan Leno's Attempt to Master the Bicycle. And for all Leno's judicious, uh, it should be fair to say that for all his judicious placement of the latest craze in all his all his musical repertoire to make it more popular. It, it, sources suggest that he was, he was a genuine bike enthusiast. He was president of the Hamilton Cycling Club and it was based at the Hamilton Hotel in Ackerman Road and that's uh, there on the bottom right. Um, uh, and he was often seen out and about with the family on a bike. So in the King Jester, uh, the life of Dan Leno, the, uh, the uh, biography of him, we learned that, uh, and I quote, sometimes Dan and Lydia, his wife, escorted their children on bicycle excursions, riding through the tree-lined streets of Clapham Park to the open spaces of Clapham, Tooting and Wandsworth Common. Uh, the the uh, family owned uh, a bike shop. There it is. There's a sign just above the assembly rooms. Um, you'll need to squint to see it, but um, it says, uh, so that's... Um, the Leno owned a bicycle shop on Ballam High Road, which was there in the early 1900s. Dan was alive when it existed, although by this stage his health was in decline. But his son John established it with the assistance of his brother in law, Sydney. Uh, Dan's only daughter, George, married Sydney, Reginald Bart Lubbock, an accountant turned cycle manufacturer from Tooting in 1903. You can see uh, one of the um, uh, uh, catalogues for uh, his bikes there on the right hand side. Worth um, mentioning uh, uh, women and the uh, emancipation of women in the craze here. So uh, nationally, uh, so bikes were a symbol of female emancipation from those early 1890s. They drove a degree of freedom from what women could do and wear. So uh, 
there was changes in women's fashion, there was an increase in physical activity and how they socialised, which was uh, driven by the bicycle. Uh, women, took up, uh, women took up recreational riding in their thousands uh, and it gave them a sense of self-reliance and independence that uh, perhaps they didn't have so much before. It, uh, cycling had become an absolute social phenomenon, bringing men and women together for a ride in the park and a chance to flirt with the opposite sex and, and avoid the chaperones. Uh, cycling drove uh, women's fashions, it was more comfortable, it was more practical. Uh, and all this is in an age where showing an ankle was considered quite risque. So you can imagine, you can see the drive and the breakthrough that the, uh, the, the bike is, um, is driving. The local angle here is that for uh, socialites, Hyde Park and Battersea Park were the places to be seen parading on bikes. Um, and you can see some uh, of the photos there and uh, cartoons. Um, and uh, there was also socialising in other parks. The one, the picture on top left there is of, of Tooting Common. Uh, the bike was um, associated with the suffragettes and suffragettes used the bike at this period of time for pamphleting and uh, the militants of them used them as getaway vehicles. The picture on the uh, right hand side there is of Rose Lamartine Yates and she was a cycling suffragette born in Lambeth in 1875. Uh, she schooled in Clapham before studying modern languages and philology at Oxford. She was a, a keen cyclist and she joined the Cycling Touring Club, we've mentioned before, in 1900 and became the first woman to be elected its governing, uh, on the governing council in 1907. She was uh, at the bedside of Emily Davison when she, Emily died on 8th of June 1913 at the Derby after throwing herself under the horse um, and she was in her guard of honour for a funeral procession. Rose went on to represent North Lambeth on the London Council in 1919. We're uh, straying over the river. We're um, at the Westminster Aquarium, fascinating venue. Uh, the Royal, uh, Royal Aquarium actually is called. So this venue is a stone's throw away from the borough boundary across the river in Westminster. Opened in 1876, it closed in 1903. It's where the Methodist Hall is located. Uh, which was built in 1911. So this place held women's racing, including six day races, which were a prominent feature of the London cycling calendar. Uh, it's extraordinary for the time. Um, it played host, the, uh, the uh, uh, aquarium itself played host to a number of events, including one build men versus women. So spect uh, spectators turned out in absolute droves to see lady cyclists. Um, it was a craze that was uh, briefly popular, very profitable for those who put, were putting it on. And it blurred the lines between sport and entertainment in that it was not too dissimilar to the gymnastic and theatrical shows that were put on by women at the pleasure gardens and uh, at the cheap uh, venues at the time. But on the other hand, it marks a milestone in uh, recognising women's cycling as a professional sport, uh, international contest, um, and it was a, a profitable commercial venture. There's um, Google uh, Sheila Hanlon and uh, you'll find heaps of information on this. She's an academic writer, writes really well, and there's heaps of free stuff on the, online uh, on this subject. Really, really good to read. Uh, lovely poster here. So if you weren't, um, let's have a little look at uh, sport and leisure, uh, which we've touched on. Uh, if, so if you weren't riding a bike in 1890s, there was a good chance you were watching people uh, ride one. So that was whether a local track, a velodrome, a vast indoor arena for a six day race or a prize match. This uh, poster is advertising a 50 mile bicycle match between John Keane, the champion of England and David Stanton, champion of America, held at the Marble Rink in uh, Clapham Road, 1881. Uh, John Keane, Happy Jack as he was known, was based in Surbiton, but he had a short spell based in Clapham with the bike manufacturing business. The Eclipse was a huge uh, seller. But uh, yeah, so he was uh, selling that out of Clapham for a while. So let's have a look at um, some of the venues. So this is uh, this is the uh, the Oval in 1892. So in the 1890s, so basic cycling paths had mushroomed into uh, many temporary and permanent circuits on a range of surfaces that included grass, cinder, and cement. And uh, this time now, virtually every town in the UK had a track of some sort. So around us, there were six first-class velodromes or tracks in close proximity, one in Catford, one in Herne Hill, one at Crystal Palace, one in Putney, one at the Oval, and one at Balham. 
Uh, and this photo here is of 1980 in, uh, from 1892 and of the 10 mile is a, a 10 mile race. And the uh, on the left there is one of the uh, programs from 1896. Um, let's move on. Uh, so but Surrey Bicycle Club were um, the, uh, the uh, club of the area. And here's some pictures from the meet at the Oval in um, 1897 from the Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News. Um, I think on the bottom one there, you can see the gas tometer. Um, and as you can see, they are riding on grass. Um, so they obviously didn't care too much about the outfield in uh, 18, 1897. So at this meet, there's approximately 5,000 people in attendance. Uh, uh, top left is the half mile professional championship. And bottom right is the 10 mile amateur final. Um, a little bit about Hyde Farm. No pictures of Hyde Farm tracks, sadly. Um, but uh, in the 1890s, Hyde Farm was, it was set to become one of the premier cycle tracks in London. So Hyde, um, Hyde Farm was uh, leased out to a succession of farmers until about the 19th century. Uh, and then when in the face of falling profits from agriculture, um, the, farm wasn't the farm was then turned over to pig farming and uh, the field to sport and recreation. The newly formed Hyde Park, uh, Hyde Farm Athletic Grounds hosted a wide variety of sports, including football, lacrosse, rugby, golf, athletics, cricket, and uh, most unusually, baseball. Baseball was enjoying a huge uh, rise in popularity following the formation of the London Baseball Association. Nice quote here from Walter Besant, who describes the uh, grounds in his book, London South of the Thames. To the west of Thornton Park stretches the great level of Hyde Farm, approached from the new park, uh, road by a rural lane with high banks leading past the baseball park to the old buildings of the farm. Of these, three very picturesque cottages remain, more or less dilapidated and used as dressing rooms by some of the clubs of the common to whom members they offer refreshments. The farm itself, stretching to Dragmire Lane, that's Cavendish Road as we know it, boasts of golf links and a cinder track for bicycling, where the greater part is rented to athletic clubs. So the cycling on the farm, the cinder track was uh, three laps to a mile um, and was hired out to a number of clubs. Clapham Ramblers were there, Delorne used Dick, Catford though was the, uh, Catford though was the track of the moment and uh, Heron Hill was soon to establish itself. Um, and High Farm didn't last long. It was by the time the number of tracks, um, by, uh, by about 1896, the number of tracks had hit saturation point, led to a decline in attendances and sponsorship. Um, Cycling popularity itself was dipping as the upper and middle classes were uh, losing interest a little bit. Um, the, the track owners were finding uh, facing uh, financial difficulties, and uh, with the suburban population increasing, uh, they were able to sell off the land quite easy for housing development. And sure enough, that's uh, what they did at Hyde Farm. The Catford track as well only lasted five years. Hyde Farm Estate was built around 1896, 1897. Um, and you saw pictures of them that on the previous slide. Crystal Palace, uh, well, a couple of them hang on, but Crystal Palace hang on a bit. Um, let's uh, get the right slide up. There we go. So cycling appeared at Crystal Palace as early as 1869. Um, the novelty of the Velocipede, which is what you can see there, um, had just hit our shores. The Crystal Palace Company, alert to such novelties and the opportunity to make a few quid, let riding take place in the uh, in the grounds. Um, so hopefully you can see that map. So in 1918-69, saw the first Philosophy Derby take place with experienced riders coming over from France to race. The race took place on the paved top terrace where the Sphinxes uh, were. So that's the area Mark C. Um, which I hopefully you can see on the uh, on the map there. I'll keep that open. Um, just going to go back. I'll go back to that map shortly. So in 1876, this is where this actual picture is taken from, or uh, etchings from. Uh, informal riding and racing was still taking place, um, and as as this uh, as this um, uh, cutting illustrates. So, um, So look at this one here. So this is uh, from 18, 1876, yeah. So, you know, um, so by now, 
a path had been extended around the lakes and by linking together they gave a circuit of about uh, three quarters of a mile uh, along the track had a couple of nasty 90 degrees so you can see it's, it's the reverse b essentially that you can see there um, and the top tier provided a good viewing platform Um, so you can see the top tier and that reverse B. So they're cycling around that reverse B with those 90 degree angles. And that couldn't have been fun. Um, the course was... Uh, uh, in, oh, sorry, yes, so 1980, we're back to uh, we're 1880 now. So there's a new site, uh, racing path uh, built in 1880, which is marked with the M uh, on the left. Hopefully you can see that in the map. So that's where that was based. And it was a coarse mixed coal and black cinder path, three and a half laps to the mile. And that was a natural bowl there where, where you can see it. Uh, and the track was built around an ornamental lake, uh, but it was, carried over, uh, it was carried on stone causeways over narrow strips of the water. So it actually went over the water. And the reports show that more one occasion uh, riders uh, landed in the drink. Opening day was October, 1880, a one mile handicap. Um, Annerley uh, Bicycle Club were formed in 1881 and began, uh, became the ground club of the second track. And they had their own clubhouse there. Uh, another club still uh, going today. Um, so so um, one of the problems with the uh, Crystal Palace was uh, that uh, promoters of race meetings couldn't charge spectators specifically watching the racing. So if you've paid your sixpence to enter the grounds, you could watch any cycling that happened to be on. And so they couldn't make it pay. So eventually that uh, the um, uh, course that we saw there was, the, was eventually drained and uh, turned into a footy pitch. Enter then uh, a, uh, an important character in South London uh, cycling history is George Lacey Hillier. He's uh, pivotal in uh, all this uh, story. Uh, Christo, uh, he, um, he was born in Sydenham in 1856, took up cycling in the 1870s, uh, lived at Ellison, 16 Sintra Park, uh, SE19. Uh, peak of his career, won the National Bicycle Championships. Uh, he was, uh, 1882, began his journalist career, stockbroking business. His father was in that as well. He was on the committee of the National Cyclist Unions, Union and he created the first amateur world championships. He lives uh, very close to Crystal Palace. Um, he uh, wrote three books, uh, Cycles, Past and Present, all about cycling and Wrinkles for Cyclists. Wrinkles is an old Victorian term for tactics. Uh, he also wrote a few uh, less than stellar themed novels. He's key to this story uh, because he uh, was the driver of the development of Herne Hill and indeed he was the director of it. He tried to uh, get uh, Crystal Palace developed, they weren't having anything of it so he, uh, he went elsewhere. And so to Hearn Hill. Uh, Hillier, uh, Hillier was introduced to the brothers William and John Peacock, who were proprietors of a building business in Water Lane, Brixton. Both were members of the Brixton Ramblers uh, Cycling Club and had been keen cyclists. So um, Hearn Hill was built, originally named the London County Grounds, the track of the London, cycling, uh, London County Cycling and Athletic Club. Uh, originally opened in 1891. Uh, there was a uh, uh, there was a lot of competition early on. Putney Velodrome opened up three months later and the velodromes were constantly vying to be the fastest and quickest uh, and uh, surfaces were changing all the time. Um, many records were beaten on this, tra uh, on this track though, which uh, reached a peak of popularity with the Kaka Cup, uh, which is, and there's a, a picture from it there. Uh, they were 24 hour races. Um, so in the Battle of the uh, Velodromes, Hearn Hill won over, Ballam, Catford, Putney and Crystal Palace all uh, closing. Crystal Palace didn't go without a fight back though. There's a, it from 1896. Um, the Palace authorities realised there was still a growth in cycling and they gave the go ahead for this bank cement track. Um, and there's another picture of it there from a different angle. Go to that other one. So you can see the... Um, palace in the background you see the bank track and there we are oh, from the grandstand view um, and how did crystal palace get through well um, get, uh, make it pay well there's some aggressive marketing to get people through the turnstiles the dunlop company had established a team of pacers at a purpose-built workshop by the track there's six quints and six quads there five trainers 
and 50, 60 men. They're all being paid full time and they would battle for uh, speed records around the track. And for three or four years, uh, crowds will turn up to see Dunlop face up against either the clock or uh, continental teams. And race meetings would get 10, 20,000 people regularly. Um, in the 1890s, track racing was one of the most popular forms of public entertainment. Races were highly paid celebrity stars. Uh, hordes of fans uh, followed their lives and uh, their, the cycling news through the, through the press. Um, as my, uh, so a couple of pictures from Crystal Palace. Uh, it's probably the highlight of Crystal Palace uh, is, um, as, a, as a venue, held the 12th World Championships in 1904, first ever held in England. My own club had riders in the warm-up act and in one in the championships. Uh, it's remembered for a brave ride by Leon Meredith, who won the 100 kilometers amateur championship with a world record. Um, and despite falling at 40 mile an hour and injuring himself with just seven kilometers to go. Um, there's a fantastic photos of, um, of the world championships in action. Um, I've thrown this in for no other reason than I just love the photo. So this is a picture of the Wright brothers flying over the cycling track in 1907. You can see the grandstand in the background, some punters in the foreground and uh, a rather precarious uh, aeroplane uh, in the sky. That's a great photo which I've pilfered from the Lambeth archives. Uh, one of the characters at the time was uh, A.E. Wills. Um, he was born in Lambeth in, on the 21st of March 1879, lived at Gilbert Road, five minutes from the Kennington Oval moved to Clapham South Side, 69, where the Rookery Bar and Kitchen is now. Um, he's, uh, his father was a bike maker. His brothers uh, were also in the trade. Um, and about this time he was making, he was already making himself uh, a name for himself as an exceptional amateur. And he raced in the Ballam Colours and won a 50 mile race in 1899, 1900, 1901. Um, and then he uh, moved to France and turned pro, where he secured the services of Bertin, a gigantic French pacemaker. And there he is, uh, who saw Wills' possibilities, if properly managed. So he's on a motorbike there, and um, he's pacing, uh, pacing Wills behind him. Motor pacing was just in development in the 1890s. It was dangerous. So between 1899 and 1928, 33 riders and 14 pacers were killed on uh, European and American tracks. Um, but nevertheless, Mr. Wills on the 17th of August, 1908, um, uh, took to the track to uh, go for the 60 in 60 world record. So um, how many miles could you do in 60 minutes? Um, Wills did increase the world motor pace record, uh, recording a 61 miles, 61.91 miles in 60 uh, minutes. Um, at some times he was riding at 67 miles an hour. Um, and his uh, pedals were whirring around to twice every second. So incredible speed. He got a big appearance money from all this, being a world record holder and uh, engagement followed. And he was, uh, he was uh, quite the star in cycling circles. By 1939, he'd moved to Twickenham and was an uh, engine fitter. Uh, there he is. Um, and that's his bike, which is in the Coventry Museum. Um, um, Finally, um, uh, exp uh, exploring. So we've talked about the technology, which means people would go further uh, in quicker times. And exploring was a huge part of the cycling phenomenon in the 1890s. And of course, South London, part of that. Uh, all roads lead out of South London to the Surrey Hills and to, uh, and to the coast. And so it was, a huge, it was a hugely popular thing to do. Uh, we, we were living in a prime area for a blast of the Surrey Hills and the coast. And London and Brighton, was very much seen as a challenge as it is and uh, as it is now. Um, here's a sketch. You can see a sketch here from the London Sporting Dramatic News in 1893. There's a large description of the journey. Um, I'll read a couple, just a couple of extracts to give you a flavour. Um, it says, uh, and so we reach Borough and a short length of wood paving for a moment or two gives us luxury and ease. Um, moving on. We are now on Macadam and close to Kennington Oval. We pass on to the left at Kennington Cross, round by the park, and bear as if it were Camberwell, but cross 100 yards further on and get to Brixton Road and its excellent wood paving. The pleasantness part of our journey so far, and we get on rising ground, scarce felt, owing to the good surface. Um, there was cycling camps were big, so the clubs used to go out from South London and head to uh, 
there's an extract from uh, the referee, which says Ballam CC went to Pulborough for the weekend. Uh, that was in 1899. And uh, we as a club thought it'd be fun to do it uh, uh, last year on, on its uh, anniversary. So we did it on its uh, anniversary and we cycled to Pulborough near some of the club at Pulborough Station. Uh, finally, um, probably worth noting that cycles, in, uh, cycles are playing a part in wartime and certainly are connected to the area. Um, they're beginning to play a, a role in war, especially for reconnaissance work and communications work. They, of course, had the advantage of being lighter, quieter, logistically much easier, with uh, no need for fuel, vehicle maintenance or horse management. Uh, they first uh, showed up in the Boer War. Um, uh, the local angle, well, from the late 1980s, cycling sections were being formed and attached to volunteer regiments across South London. So. Um, you could turn to Brigade HQs in 1898 in, uh, in nearby Bermondsey, Camberwell, uh, Wimbledon, Kingston, uh, and in, uh, in Lambeth itself in Kennington. So I guess it's a final word on its decline, really. Uh, so that was the glory years. Uh, cycling clubs, though, soon disbanded. Velodromes were closed. Manufacturing disappeared in great numbers. As the craze came to an end, really, the upper middle classes who made the bulk of members and put the purchasing power, simply moved on to new leisure fads, uh, and such as the motor car, which was um, heading over the horizon. Um, and we wouldn't see a craze like it again, really, until about the 1920s when uh, working men and women's cycle clubs began to uh, uh, go on the rise. So I'll stop there. As I say, plenty on the internet, plenty of historical reading. Uh, there's a veteran cycling club you can join. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, there's a couple of cracking books on the history of Herne Hill and Crystal Palace. And anyway, I hope that was a, uh, an insight into the golden period of cycling and uh, oh, I've run on a bit, sorry about that. <laughs>